So in section 10.1, we're going to continue learning our Greek letters. In this case, the new Greek letter here is Rho, right here. Spelled R-H-O, pronounced R-O-W. It's the latest population parameter that we're going to be testing. And this one tests whether or not there's a linear correlation between two variables. So let's understand a few things about R. So we've got a handout. Let's take a quick look at that. R is what's called the linear correlation coefficient. So that's right here. And the value of R is somewhere between 1 and negative 1. So negative 1 is less than or equal to R is less than or equal to 1. Of course, this is your sample statistic. But the same thing holds true for the population parameters. So 1, excuse me, negative 1 is less than or equal to rho, which is less than or equal to 1. Okay, so what does R reflect? R reflects the strength of a linear relationship between two variables. So let's go down to the bottom of our handout and look at some of the graphs. We'll start with A here, which is a perfect negative relationship. That is, everything's on the same straight line. As you increase the value for X, you decrease the value for Y. So it has a negative slope and hence a negative value for R, its linear correlation coefficient. So that's a perfect linear relationship because everything is exactly on that line. Now, if everything's not perfect, but if it's close to perfect, then you're going to get a value of R that's close to 1 or negative 1. In this case, you're going to get something that's close to negative 1, but not perfectly negative 1. So we get a value of R of negative 0.94. Okay, still, if I know the value of X, it does a pretty good job of telling me what the value of Y is. And that's what you're measuring when you're talking about the linear correlation coefficient. How well does knowing the value of X tell me the value of Y in the linear sense? Moving over a little bit farther, does it look like there's much of a linear relationship between x and y in this case? No. No. Uh, absolutely not. So knowing the value of x, I mean, y could be still kind of anything here. So there's not much of a linear relationship. And because of that, you get a value of r that's pretty close to 0. Not very much different than 0, which makes sense. How about over here? Again, we've got a nice positive correlation here. In this case, it's a positive 1 because all this data lies exactly on a straight line. So this is one of the extreme values for the value of R. R is a positive 1. Moving away from a perfect linear correlation, you get something like this. So, okay, not perfect, but still... Knowing the value of x does give you a pretty good idea of where to find y, so that's nice. You get an r, which is not as good as it, as it could be, but still not bad. Last but not least, let's take a look at this one. Is there a relationship here between x and y? Not necessarily a linear relationship, but is there a relationship? Yeah, this is really a semicircle. But is it a linear relationship? No. And that's why you're getting an R value of 0, is because the relationship here, even though there is one, is not linear. So R represents the linear relationship between your two variables. Let's go through that some more by looking at one of the problems in the book. It's problem number 4. Okay. So here's five different data sets. And what they want you to do is match the data with the following values of R squared. So 0 0.268, 0 0.992, 
negative 1, 0.746, and positive 1. So let's see if we can't match the data with the corresponding value of R given to us by the problem. So I'll give you a moment to look at that. Remember when you're watching this at home, this is my cheap version of a pause button. Because my software doesn't actually have a pause button. Okay, suppose you're doing this on a test. It makes sense to get the easiest ones first, right? Which two are the easiest ones? All right, good. So the easiest ones are 1 and negative 1. So 1 would be E, negative 1 would be A. Then the next easiest one is probably 0.992, because you know it has to be pretty close to a solid straight line, but not perfect. So which one's that one going to be? D. Good. So that's D. Now, it comes down to these two for the last one, 0.268 and 0.746. Uh, what do you think? Which one looks a little bit closer to the line and which one looks closer to randomness? Which one's closer to the line or the 0.746? I'm thinking B. Other than these two points out here, that looks like a pretty good linear relationship. This looks pretty random. So I'd give that one the 0.268. This one, the 0.746. So, good. Keep in mind, what you're doing with R is you're measuring the strength of a linear relationship. Now, the good news for us is that we don't have to do this by hand. Maybe it's worth taking a quick look at, if I can find it here, what people used to have to do by hand in order to calculate R. It was a lot. What's that? Probably. Um, so this would be your data, and all the rest of this would be the calculations that you would need to go through in order to get R. Just a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. You'd have to sum up all these columns. You'd have to square each of these columns and then sum them up. Take the product of those two to get this column and then sum that up. Then calculate all three of these things, which are functions of these five up here. And then do the ratio of this and the product of these two underneath the square root. Wow. Yeah, you want to do it? It should only take 20 minutes <laughs> for a simple problem. <laughs> all right. So the good news is that we don't have to do this by hand. That technology is coming through for us. So we're going to do this with uh, a few days data sets starting with one that was done for my morning class. And I don't know if anyone wants to volunteer on this or not. Um, what we did was we measured two different things. We measured people's height, and we also measured what I call the wingspan, that is how, how far it goes from tip to tip each finger. So if you want to take a minute or two, we can do a couple volunteers, add to the data set, uh, or I can just use the five that I had from this morning. Anyone want to measure their height and wingspan? Become part of the data? Charbel. All right, good deal. So let me pause that there. Uh, add to our data sets. Uh, no, let's, we've got to go in the back.
volunteers today have been males. Just singing. That's all right. Um, all right, so here's our data set, and we're gonna type we're gonna type this in in terms of uh, inches. So let's see here. Um, let's see. I want to go over to stat disk. And we're going to type it in column one and column two. So I need to add in Charbel. So that would be 66 and 65. So it'll be interesting to see if that brings any changes from my morning class. So if you wanted to follow along on StatDisk, let me read to you the first row, and then I'll read to you the second row. So we'll start out with 73, then 70, then 69. 66, 71, and 66. Mm, let's see. Then for our second row, second column, I should say, 78, 74, 72, 70, 70, and 65. So let's see what happens when we try and investigate this, take a quick look at our data. So if you just want to look at your data, you can do a scatter plot. Underneath the column, underneath the data menu, you'll see scatter plot. Where's your data that you want plotted? Well, it's in column one and in column two, and then plot. So there's our data. Okay. What do you think? Is there uh, a linear relationship between these two? Maybe. A little bit sketchy. Um, I think if we had more data, that'd be good, but we don't, so that's fine. Let's actually do the calculation now. So go to Analysis, and then down to Correlation and Regression. Again, we want columns 1 and 2. So here, you can click Evaluate, and it's going to do a lot of work for us. It's going to tell us uh, all kinds of statistics, some of which we're going to work on in the next section, some of which we'll work on here. So, ooh, interesting results here. Charbel, you have made a significant difference. Let me be very careful about describing what we're going to do here. We're going to do a hypothesis test. We want to decide, is there a significant linear correlation or not? So the null hypothesis is that there's no linear correlation. So let's take a quick look at that. Um, so this is problem number four. Uh, this is our own example. H naught is that rho is equal to zero. The alternative hypothesis is that rho is different than zero. Now, if rho is different than zero, that means there's a significant nonlinear correlation, or there's a significant linear correlation. That is, there's a, there's a linear relationship between one of these, or these two variables. Uh, alpha is typically 0.05, so we'll stick with that. Um, step three, eh, we don't really need that. I will talk about that a little bit. Um, step four. Did anyone catch our p-value? Yeah, 0.049. All right, so p-value is 0.049. Now, if I was using the standard set by my student Ruben in my morning class, he wanted us to tell, test this at alpha is 0.01. But at the 0.05 level, can we reject the null hypothesis? Yes, at the 0.05 level, we can reject it. So. Like I said, you made a significant difference because my, my data from this morning didn't reject H0. But here we can reject H0. So that's good. Let's take care of that. Uh, step five, reject H0. Now in these, for the most part, your original claim is that there's 
or the claim that you're testing is whether or not there's a significant relationship between these two variables. Um, so that would be that this is different than zero. And maybe we can talk a little bit about why we're testing this, and this is our original claim. But uh, the data support the claim that there's a relationship between height and wingspan. Or maybe I should put the sample data. Support the claim that there is a relationship between height and wingspan. I should put a linear relationship. Cool. Let's do another one, kind of like this one from the book, but it's going to be pretty much the same kind of thing here. You're going to set up your null and alternative hypothesis, decide on alpha, get your p-value, accept or fail to re reject H naught, or fail to reject H naught, and then state your conclusion in words. So pretty similar stuff to what we're doing, uh, it's just a new application of it. We're looking all right in, problem, uh, in this first example. Okay, let's take a look at problem number 22. Yeah, John? I just have a question. Now, if your p-value, since we're so close to our alpha, if our p-value equals alpha, which means that the alpha. Yeah, I've, I've never actually seen that, although I've seen close. Like, this one is remarkably close. So, so that's where, you know, I would argue that it's good to publish your paper with, um, with your p-value. Say, look... I know we didn't make it to the rejection level, but look, we were so close. We're at 0 .0 or 0 0.0501. That's really close. I think that if we had more data, that we would have been able to reject H0. So you can argue things that way. That I think there is a linear relationship here. We just couldn't quite get there. Now, like I said, this morning, I only had five people in my data set, and I didn't quite get to reject Actually, the p-value wasn't even that close. It was like 0.17. But adding that one more variable, that one other data point, we, we snuck underneath the 0.05 level. And actually, it was really close. If you look at it, we were 0.0492. <laughs> that was really, really close. So that's about as close as I've seen to uh, an actual 0.05 level. Uh, so it's helpful to publish your p-values, I think, because it, it allows the reader to make up their own mind. They might look at that and go, no, I want to apply Rubin's standard of 0.01, you know, so I don't, I'm not convinced. Other people might say, yeah, you know what, if you had more data, it probably would have been significant. So, yeah, appreciate the question. Okay, so problem number 22 then. Let's look at that one. And uh, what you're going to want to do is save this data in StatDisk because we're going to use it again in section 10.2. Right now we're just testing as to whether or not there's a significant linear relationship that is a correlation between these two. Okay. So I'm going to have to leave this one up here, I guess. Um, hold your breath. Don't move. All right. Good. So a classic application of correlation involves the association between the temperature and the number of times a cricket chirps in one minute. Listen below are the numbers of chirps in one minute and the corresponding temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit. Is there sufficient evidence to conclude that there is a linear relationship between the number of chirps in one minute and the temperature? So, okay. Let's take a look at that. We're going to do that with StatDisk. So I can get rid of this. Um, personally, I already have my data entered, but I'll read it off to you to help you input that data. So, like I said, you want to save this one. I've got it in columns four and five, but you can put it wherever you want. Just don't type over it because you're going to want to have that later. 
So for the number of chirps, whatever column you're putting it in, it's 882 is the first one. So 882 followed by 1186, so 1186, 1104, 864, 1200, 1032, 960, and then 900. In column 5, or whatever column, your Y column, temperatures starting with 69.7, then 93.3, 84.4, 85.4, 86, 82.6, 86.6, 71.6, and 79.6. Okay, cool. So hopefully you got all the data entered. If we're going to test a claim of a linear correlation between these two, um, two numbers, that is the number of chirps per minute and the temperature, then let's set that up. Uh, wrong one. This one. There we go. So I'm going to get rid of this. So for problem 22, we're going to start out with a hypothesis of rho equals 0 versus rho is different than 0. I'd be really hard-pressed to think of a situation in which you want to test it just one-sided, that is greater than or less than. It's pretty much going to be two-sided, as near as I can tell. Alpha, in this case... Let's go back to Rubin's standard of 0.01. I don't think they specified alpha for us in this case. Step three, we'll actually go back and fill this in. I need to introduce you to a table where this stuff is. And then step four and step five. Let's look back at our data. Uh, wrong data set over here. Let's just uh, go straight for the juggler. Let's go straight to correlation and regression because we can get a scatter plot from this menu. Now pick the columns with your X and Y variables. For me, that's 4 and 5. Significance level is 0 0.05. Got that. When everything's set... Oh, that's right, 0 0.01. Um, 0 0.01. Thank you. When we click evaluate, then we get what we need. We get the value of the correlation coefficient is 0 0.873. So that's good. There's something else we want to know here. So that's R is 0.873. What else do I need to know from this menu? Good, the p-value. P-value is 0 0.00462. And from there, we can make a decision in step five. Connor, what are we going to do with... The null hypothesis. Fail to reject H naught or reject H naught? Good. Reject H naught. That's definitely lower than the p value. This is your original claim. So in part six, step six, we can do kind of the same thing that we've been doing all along. That is, state our conclusion in words. And if you need a little help with that, then that little business is right here.
Remember, your original claim is that there is um, a linear correlation. That means rho is different than zero. Remember, your original data was the number of chirps in one minute and the temperature. Want to give that one a shot? What would that look like in words? Perfect. Perfect. I wrote it a little bit differently, but we're saying the same thing. Uh, basically, the sample data supports this claim, and that claim is in the alternative hypothesis. Nice. How are we looking with that one? Okay. All right, if it's all right with you, um, I'm going to do one of your homework problems with you because there's a conclusion that you, you should really see out of this one. And it's going to be problem number 11. I'm going to do all four parts of this. Let's start out with the data set here and an easy one for part A. Here's your data, X and Y. And don't overlook that there's this little point way up here in the upper right. Does there look like there's a linear relationship between X and Y here? Mm. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Tell you what, um, we don't have to be subjective about it. Uh, my morning class said that there was. You guys said that there wasn't. Both answers are fine. It's a subjective call at this point. But let's see. Let's put this data into our data set. So really what you've got are all these points. So a point here, a point here, here, and so on. Let me help you list all those different coordinates. So let's put those in stat disk. that. So what I would suggest for your x's, start out by typing the number 1 three times. You got 1, 1, and 1, and then 2, 2, and 2. So type 2 three times, and 3 three times, and the last one's going to be a 10. So triple 1's, triple 2's, triple 3's, and then a 10. Now let's go over and do the Y's. It's just going to be 1, 2, 3, and then 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 again, and last but not least, 10. We can check that we got it all by plotting the data. So if you went to data and then scatter plot, columns 1, actually it's not in column 1, is it? It's column 7 and 8 for me. I'm not sure where it is for you. So, okay. You got those down here, and then you got that one up there. All right. Not bad. Let's see if there's a significant linear relationship here. So part A for problem number 11, that was a subjective yes or no. Do you think there's a significant linear relationship? 
For part B, we're actually going to test whether or not there's a significant linear relationship. Oops. Always do that. So let's set up the null and alternative hypothesis. Rho equals zero versus rho is different than zero. We'll test that at uh, the 5% level. And I still owe you a step three here. Remind me after we're done with this problem. Um, but step four, we need the p-value. Step five is our decision. Did anyone run the regression? All right. Correlation, 7 and 8. I said run the regression. That's a little bit ahead of where we're at right now. And wow, get a pretty small p-value here, don't we? So the p-value in this case is 0 0.00031. What's that tell us to do about ho reject good so reject ho now assuming that we're testing for whether or not there's a, a significant linear correlation the presence of a significant linear correlation really means that we're working in ha so your original claim Let's see, should be, yeah. Your original claim is this one. Let's see if we can't set up our conclusion. Does your original claim contain the condition of equality? No. Did we reject? Yes. So the sample data support the claim that there's a linear relationship between X and Y. So step six. Sample data support the claim that there is a linear relationship between X and Y. All right, good. So, you know, regardless of what you said in part A, uh, for part B, you should end up with, yeah, there is a significant linear relationship. But a few of you were skeptical. And I think you were skeptical because, skeptical because of all those points down below here. And let me move this up a little bit. These points. This looks kind of random. So what if we got rid of this point up here at 1010? Let's do that. So let me close this out. And let's just take that point at 1010 and remove it from our data set. So let's get rid of that and that. And we'll rerun the analysis. So data, no, analysis, there we go. Correlation and regression, columns 7 and 8. Evaluate. So let's do our hypothesis test here. We're going to test uh, in part C, H naught says that rho equals zero versus rho does not equal zero. We'll keep alpha at 0 0.05. Figure out what uh, the p-value was, and then reject or fail to reject, and then your conclusion in words. So pretty standard as far as the procedure goes here. For those of you who haven't uh, input this, 
or didn't rerun the regression. Here's the output. So this one's pretty interesting. Um, what was the p-value here? One. So the p-value is one. P equals 1.000. What's that say in step five? Fail reject. Absolutely. I mean, this fails to reject about as miserably as you can. I mean, I almost feel like saying this actually proves H0 is true, although you can't really say that because we're assuming it to begin with. But, uh, boy, it certainly feels like that. So fail to reject H0. And let's just dress it up at least a little bit. How about epic fail to reject H0? Because that's, that's pretty bad. P-value of 1. That's as bad as it can get. Uh, last but not least, we need to state that in words. Uh, anyone want to take a shot at that? How does it look in words? Catherine? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. So there's not sufficient evidence to support the claim that there's a linear relationship between X and Y, or a linear correlation. That's fine. Either one is fine there. So what that's showing you is how influential one point can be. If you look back at the data, um, not having that one point made all the difference in the world, didn't it? It went from a significant relationship to a non-significant relationship in one point. It drastically changed things. It wasn't even close. I mean, you had a p-value of 1, in this case, versus a p-value of 0 .00, was it 342 or something like that in the other one? Um, yeah, zero, three zeros, 0, 0, 0, 3, 1. So one went from highly significant to not significant at all. Bottom line is that correlation can be very sensitive to outliers, just like the mean can. Uh, okay. That's what I wanted to get across there with that example. Uh, are you comfortable with correlation? Do you have a good idea of what, it, what it's getting at? The linear correlation is talking about the strength of that linear relationship. Now, correlation also tends to suggest other things as well. And it's, it comes close to, but it's not the same as a cause and effect relationship. Over the weekend, there's a kind of a fun study that came out and it talked about, uh, and how many dog owners do we have here? Yay, dogs rock, all right. I got two of them. It means they're gonna live extra long, right? All right. Does want to live longer and get a dog? Well, it was funny. They, they actually interviewed one of the researchers, and one of the researchers says, well, we can't, we can't say that there's a cause and effect relationship, which I thought was really sharp of the researcher. I mean, it's, it's tempting to say that, you know, having a dog causes you to live longer because that's what they found. 
they found that uh, pets, you know, people who own dogs in particular, uh, were much more likely to have fewer heart attacks and much less likely to die. So if you click on the link here, and I did, it actually takes you to the study. And there's a few things I want to point out here about the study because we've done stuff like this. So uh, they had an enormous sample size. Wow, three million. That's huge. I mean, if you look at uh, a lot of the polls done in the United States when they forecast national elections, it's usually a thousand or two thousand. So to have three million and to follow them for twelve years is huge. It's an enormous study. But there's a few things here that are, are worth looking at. They calculated hazard ratios. What's that? Well, it's a ratio between two things. It's your chance of dying if you had a dog divided by your chance of dying if you didn't have a dog. Now, if that hazard ratio is less than one, that means you know, you're better off having a dog because you have a lower chance of dying. And take a look here. There was a 95% confidence interval associated with that hazard ratio. And that ratio um, in single dog owner households was a hazard ratio of 0.67. Wow. That means you're, um, you're one-third less likely to die if you have a dog as opposed to not having a dog. That's exactly what that means. Um, it also gives you a lower risk of a heart attack, Cor ca uh, cardiovascular disease, CVD, right? So, and again, your, your hazard ratio here was smaller. Um, let's see, I might be getting clicking on the wrong one. Yeah. Uh, so all these hazard ratios are much, much smaller. Now, I kind of did a quick look. I didn't find any p-values here, but... Um, in this study, but it's, it's just chock full of stuff that we've done so far in this course. Confidence intervals, uh, null alternative hypothesis. The one thing that they couldn't claim, and the author was careful about this, is a cause and effect. You can't necessarily say, based on this one study, that one causes the other, although it's certainly a good argument for it. And next week, when we get back from our break, uh, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about cause and effect relationship. For now, though, uh, let me ask a few questions of you about causation versus correlation. Which one is which one is present amongst all of these different possibilities here? So let's go through that. Uh, someplace in your book is a study about pizza prices and subway prices in New York. There's a significant correlation, but is it also a causation? Does one cause the other? Price price of pieces going up causes the price of subway tokens to go up. No, no, not talk about subway in New York is that the one you step on the train and travels on the ground. Yeah, the price of one does not cause the other one to go up. I mean, they both kind of generally go up with time, you know, there's inflation, but no, there's not a cause and effect relationship here. Um, this one, I think we've talked about this one before, but let's review it again. Um, your weight and the number of hours you spend watching TV, there's a significant correlation there. Is it a causation? No. What causes you to gain weight is eating too much late at night while we're watching TV or something like that, not getting enough exercise. Basically, um, you're not burning as many calories as you take in. So it's, it's a correlation, but it's not a causation. Somebody was arguing with me about this in my morning class. Smoking and your chance of getting lung cancer. Causation. Yeah, I think causation. But she said that uh, her nutrition instructor says it's a correlation. I'm like, no. To me, it's a causation. This is true, but that. Some of them are from smoking, but you can't, like, say, like, sure. oh, because you smoke, you're going to get cancer. Mm, but is it just because people smoke and die from other things doesn't necessarily mean there's not a correlation or cause and effect there. I think smoking does cause cancer, 
what happens is that among the 4,000 different chemicals in cigarette smoke, uh, tar binds with radioactive elements like radon in the air. It brings it down into your lungs. And once it's in your lungs, it's in your body, it, uh, it's radioactive disintegrations alter the DNA of your cells, and you get some cells that rapidly produce themselves, and that's cancer. So I, th I, think, that's a, I think that's a causal mechanism. What's that? <laughs> yeah. It's a tough one to judge. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, this one, I, mean, I don't know. I, I think there's a causation. Uh, fortunately, you, you're, you're passing this class. doesn't depend on whether or not we agree on this one. Um, let's do some others that uh, hopefully are a little bit more clear. Uh, the thermometer in your car and one on a bank sign. You know, if, if they're both working correctly, you know, there, there should be a correlation, right? Your temperature that you read for your, on your car should be close to the one that's on the bank sign that you pass by. But is it a, is it a causal effect? No. Your, you know, whatever your thermometer says in your car doesn't cause the bank to read a certain amount. So it's not a causation. Netflix puts out ratings. So if Netflix, you know, puts out an average rating for a movie and you're rating for the movie, is that a causal relationship or a correlation? I don't know. I, I, this isn't necessarily just because Netflix says that, you know, a lot of people said it's good doesn't necessarily mean you have to like it, right? It, 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 could, it could change change your, change your predisposition. You might say, oh, well, people like that Netflix. Maybe you won't be as critical. But I don't necessarily think it causes it. All right, let's do a couple more here. Um, number of searches for the flu or flu-like symptoms on Google and the number of cases of flu in a ge geographic area. Correlation, yeah. Just because you type in flu or flu-like symptoms doesn't mean you have the flu or you're going to get the flu. All right, it might mean somebody near you has the flu. But <laughs> <laughs> all right and owning a dog and living longer well we kind of went through that one already um they haven't established causation yet although you know you'd like to it's tempting it's tempting it'd be fun okay let me give you some homework uh for homework in the 13th edition and the 12th edition, try 1 through 19. The 12th edition's actually got a cool one for problem number 19. It talks about um, how there's a correlation between the light you receive from a galaxy and how far away it is. So it's, it actually gives researchers a way to try and measure um, the distances to galaxies. Cool. Enjoy.